All right, I'm excited about opening up our Bibles today. Got the Word of God in front of us. Um, studying God's work, a word is work, so let's get to work. Let's, let's put it in. Uh, but before we dive in, I, I really think it's good of us before we open God's Word and read that we ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us because if the Holy Spirit is not at work in this moment, all of this is a waste. And so go ahead and just bow your heads for a couple seconds and just ask the Holy Spirit to open up your heart to, to receive the truth of Romans chapter 12 uh, for your life that you could walk in obedience. So I'll give you a moment. God, speak to us. Help us to look at Romans this morning with reverence and respect for your word. Help us to be doers, not just hearers. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, our text for this morning is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We're just covering two verses this morning, so go ahead in your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what it is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. All right, so as normal here at Fairlawn, uh, we're just going to work through the verses uh, just section by section, phrase by phrase to make sure we understand what Scripture is saying to us. So we'll start with Paul's first part of the verse here where he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. Now when he says, therefore, we have to ask, what's it there for? Like, what did he say that he's now saying? Because of this, therefore, this. Well, the therefore stands for all 11 chapters of Romans that brings us up to chapter 12. The church, the broad church, has gained so much good theology from the first 11 chapters of of Romans, And hopefully that's true for us too as a church as we journey through um, these chapters. The first chapters of Romans, we have our first banner here, uh, talked, to, talked about justification. We could understand the good theology of what actually saves us and how it's not our works. Um, it's by putting our faith in Christ and anyone and everyone who puts their faith in Christ will be saved. The next section of Roman that, Romans that we went through is sanctification. And the second banner here in sanctification is the way that God is sanctifying us, making us holy, making us um, into his image, the way that he is molding us into who he wants us to be, right? And then the third section of Romans that we worked through was proclamation, where we learned from Romans the mission of the church, to proclaim the gospel. And that if the church isn't proclaiming the gospel, we're missing our mission. And how as Fairlawn, we're a small piece of a big puzzle of God gospelizing the world. And we need to own our mission of looking at our community as our responsibility to make sure they know Jesus. Amen? And so what Paul's saying now is, therefore, because you know about justification, because you know the good theology of sanctification, because you know proclamation, therefore, and this is Paul's appeal, therefore, let that knowledge, let that theology change and transform every aspect of your life. Which leads us to our fourth and final phase of Romans, our fourth banner, which is transformation. Because you know that you are saved and you understand how that works, because you know you're sanctified, because you know your mission, therefore, let it transform every part of your life. Because of these 11 chapters that we've spent in good theology, now this is where the rubber meets the road. Okay, if you're a really practical person, I know we got some country boys, some country girls um, in this room, and like sometimes we're just like, okay, I don't get into like the whole philosophy thinking and all that kind of stuff. Like I, I like to know real practical, like what do you want me to do? God, what is it? I'll do it. If you're a super practical person, you may have gotten frustrated with us as we've traveled for the last year and five months. The last year and five months through the first 11 chapters of Romans. That's how long it took us to get through 11 chapters of Romans. 
if you value really practical application, and you may at times have got frustrated with us when we talked a lot about just the way that we think, the theology of how we process these different terms. But now, this last section of Romans, you're going to get excited about because it's where the rubber meets, meets the road. It's where application happens. It's because I've taken these 11 chapters to help develop your theology. Now, since your mind is in the right place, now, here's how it should change your life. And really, whether you value, highly value practical application or you highly value um, the philosophical thinking about stuff and kind of the, the different ways of processing, uh, we should always value the question after each sermon, how then shall we live? Right? That should be a question we're always asking after each sermon. How then should we live? What changes because I know this truth? That's why we have D groups. Because we wanted people to break down in small groups after each Sunday to talk about how then should we live? How does this apply to us? What, what changes about us knowing the truth that we are unpacking? So Paul's saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers... By the mercies of God. So Paul is using the mercies of God to categorize everything that God has done for us. Justification, sanctification. Because of all these things which Paul's categorizing of the mercies of God. Therefore, and he's going to call us to do something. Now there's a, there's a pattern with Paul that we need to notice. Before Paul asks us to do stuff. This happens in a lot of his letters that he writes in the New Testament. Before Paul asks us to obey or to do something, he likes to remind us of everything that Christ has done for us. It's kind of a safeguard for legalism to make sure that we're not obeying Christ and doing stuff simply because we're supposed to, even though there's a lot of truth to that. It's not really the right posture of obedience that, that God desires. See, Paul wants us and God desires for us to obey out of a heart of gratitude and out of a heart of love. For God, knowing what he's done, not out of fear or pressure. If we obey God out of fear or out of pressure to perform as a Christian, the Christian life will feel like chains. But if we obey God out of love for him and out of pleasure, where it would just be our, our greatest delight to somehow do something back to God after he's given us so much, has done so much to us. If there's some way, it would be my absolute pleasure. If there's some way I could somehow give back to you, God. If that's our posture, the Christian life will feel like freedom. And it's vitally important that we obey God's commands. Not out of fear or pressure, but out of love and pleasure. If we want to live the abundant life that Christ has for us. So Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul's saying the right response to the mercies of God is worship. The right response to knowing good theology, to knowing justification, sanctification, proclamation, the right response is worship. And Paul is calling this spiritual worship, where we desire that God would be glorified through everything we say and do. Now, I want to kind of talk about worship, the definition of worship a little bit here, because I feel like sometimes we get it a little wrong because we call our corporate singing time worship. And it's true, that is worship. But worship is so much bigger than just when we gather together and sing songs. And really every aspect of our service this morning is worship. When you gather together and greet each other and talk and encourage each other, that's worship. When, you, when we're listening to a sermon like we are now and taking in the word of God and, and asking the spirit to, to change us, that's worship. Um, it's not just a singing time. And the definition of worship is way bigger than just what happens here on a Sunday morning corporately. Paul is making the case that every single thing that we do out of reverence and adoration to God is worship. And we are to present our bodies in that way to say, God, everything I say, everything I do, I want to do out of reverence for you. I want to do as adoration to you. 
I want to do with this ultimate chief motive that I want to see God glorified. And when we act in that way, every single one of our actions are worship. Kids, I got a, I got a project for you, okay? So if you're a kid or an adult that feels like a kid, go ahead and get out a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper. And I'd like for you to draw a picture of, something, of you doing something for God. Uh, draw a picture of something you think God would want you to do because every action we do out of obedience to God is worship. And so I'd love to see your pictures afterwards um, of you doing something that you believe God would love for you to do that would please God. So here we see that Paul's making this appeal that we should sacrifice our lives in a way that everything is done in a way that God receives recognition and ultimate glory. Paul is saying that we should present our bodies as the term he's using here as living sacrifices for the purpose of worship. Now, I want to clear up some things with the term living sacrifice. Uh, when it comes to sacrificing, uh, Paul is not advocating for us to lay down on an altar and set our bodies on fire and burn ourselves on an altar. That's not, that's not what he's saying um, as, as honoring worship to God. That's why he puts the word living in there. It's a, it's a living sacrifice. It's something we do while that happens. It's a, it's a kind of sacrifice and worship that happens when we're alive in our bodies. Um, now, sacrifices usually were interpreted as like a death of an animal or some kind of other, of, of death of some other kind. Um, and Paul is specifically calling it a sacrifice for a reason. There is a death that's happening. That's why he's using a living sacrifice. Um, but he's not talking about dying physically. He's talking about dying spiritually to our sinful tendencies. And the reason we know that that's the kind of death he's talking about is because he's talked a lot about it in the last 11 chapters. Uh, especially in Romans chapter 6 when he says, What should we say then? Should we go on sinning so that grace will increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with Christ through death. And just as Christ was raised to life, we were raised to life with him so that we could walk in the newness of life. Paul's saying we should be known as people who die to our sins. And Paul is describing our sinful nature as this self-centered living in a way that brings glory to us. And what changes when we die to that is now we live completely to bring glory to God. That's our most greatest desire is that God would somehow be glorified through our life. See, Christianity should change every part of how we live. It should change every part of how we use our bodies. Christianity should change how we use our hands. The things that we reach towards and the things that we pull back. Christianity should change our feet, the things that we walk or run towards, the things that we run away from and say, I don't want nothing to do with that. Christianity should change our mouths, what we consume and put in, and what we say, no, I will not consume or put that in. Christianity should change our tongues, the words that we form and say and the words that we will not form or say. Christianity should change our eyes, what we look at and dwell on and call good and beautiful and what we look at and turn away from and say, I do not want to, I don't want to see that. I don't want to meditate on that with my eyes. That's wrong. Christianity should change our sexuality. What we say, this is sexually good, pure, and right, and that which is no. That's wrong, that's sin, and I will not partake in that act. When Paul uses the word sacrifice, a living sacrifice, he's saying it's a reason it's a sacrifice is because naturally you're going to want to do what is wrong with your bodies. You are going to be prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. You're going to be prone to wonder. And that's why you have to give up what you naturally want to do in order to present your bodies to God as worship. We sing this old hymn here. I love it. It's one of our favorite songs that we sing at Fairlawn. It's Jesus paid it all. What's that next line? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. I love bringing the music down with the band when we're singing that song. Because for some reason, this church is loud on that song. 
you guys sing loud. I think it's because it just really resonates with us. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. What we're seeing is there's not a single part of me that's for me. My, I've been purchased by Jesus, and my whole life I owe to him. Every word, every action, every thought, it is all his. And that's presenting myself as a living sacrifice. I don't consider my life my own. I consider my life to belong to somebody else. Therefore, I don't do what I think is best. Now, Paul uses the word holy and then the words acceptable to God as two filters that help us understand how our actions are to be done in worship and not out of selfish sinfulness. So the first word uh, you see holy in verse 1. Holy simply means uh, set apart. It's just different. Um, So our actions, we know that potentially they're going to be worship when they're set apart. If they're just like the world's, we know they're not worship. But when they're set apart as holy for a very specific purpose, and that would be to, to, to worship God, a very specific purpose set apart. How many of you guys have been in a, in a crowd of people, whatever, just walking around? You meet a stranger, you start hanging out with a stranger, you're talking with them. And you can just tell by their mannerisms that they are another Christian. How many of you guys have ever experienced that? You're just like, I know you're a Christian. Right. You can just tell by the way they speak, their actions. They're just different from the people around. They were set apart for something different. You see God coming out of them. By the way, like the biggest compliment anyone could give me is if someone would say that about me, just saying, I don't know who you are, bro, but uh, you're different. <laughs> you're different. You're not like the world. Oh, man, that would be a great compliment. Uh, and then it, Paul also uses the filter of acceptable to God. I don't feel like I need to unpack that. I feel like you guys know what acceptable to God, things that are honoring, glorifying Uh, to God. And how we do this is remember the mercies of God. I appeal to you therefore by by the mercies of God that you are to have a heart of gratitude towards the gospel. This is where the gospel is the, this is where the gospel turns the center of our whole lives is that where everything we do is based out of gratitude for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thankful for the way that he loved us, died for us, saved us, And out of that comes a heart to see him glorified above all else, and then we become a living sacrifice. Where we can say our strongest desire is to see God glorified. And this is going to sound crazy to some of you, but that means, if all that is true, that means that slicing carrots in a kitchen can be worship. Crazy, huh? That means... That driving a tractor in a field can be worship. That means that driving a car to Walmart can be worship. That means that changing diapers, and trust me, I've seen my share of horrible diapers, okay? Changing the awful diapers. I'm talking about the bad ones, the big summer blowouts. Those diapers can be and should be worship. That means working behind a desk can be worship, should be worship. That means playing volleyball should be worship. Everyday tasks can be done either with selfish motives to try to make me look better, to set my life up better, or can be done out of heart of a heart gratitude, full of gratitude for the gospel, and a heart that sees God, wanting God to be glorified above all else. And be done as worship. Now let's get super practical here. How can a person cleaning their house do it in a way that is worship? That is holy and acceptable to God. Now the answers are unlimited here. Um, I'll give you a few suggestions in case that's really throwing you for a loop. Um, What about when you're cleaning your house, you're just using the time in your mind to thank God that you have a house. Thank God that you have a place, a shelter over your head. That's worship. Giving God the glory for what what he's given you. What about when you're cleaning your house, you're doing it because you want your home to be a place of joy, peace, so that you can disciple your children as well, an environment that can really grow and learn about Christ. That's worship. That's desiring to see God glorified. What about uh, being a good steward? Or what what about inviting neighbors 
to your home. And that's why you're cleaning it. You want your, you want your home to be a nice place for neighbors to come in so that you can build a relationship with them. And you can share the gospel, own our mission as a church. In cleaning your house, you're doing it in a way to desire God to be glorified. And therefore, it's worship. What about a business person working their job as worship? How can a business person worship God with their job? What about doing his or her job with complete integrity? Boy, don't we need that in the business world? That's worship. You will, it will be holy. You will be set apart. People will look at you different because you refuse to budge on your integrity. People see the character of God in you. God is glorified, and therefore, you just did job, your job as worship. Uh, what about caring for the people around you in, in the different offices that you work in? You just check on them. See how they're doing with the divorce. You see how you're doing, they're doing with the kid that just got in trouble. and Just caring for them because you want them to experience the love of Christ. That's worship. What about the money you use from your business to support missions, ministries, to help out your friend who's going through poverty? That's worship. Doing the things with Christ. With your money, that's worship. Uh, what, let's do one more. How can a teenager playing basketball be worship? Well, what about when that teenager plays really bad? Instead of getting really discouraged and angry with himself, because his identity is in Christ, he says, I'm okay with playing a bad game. What? He's like, my identity is in Christ, not in my game. That's worship. What about... Having gospel conversations with his teammates, sharing, actively sharing the gospel with those he plays beside. That's worship. What about giving God the glory when he's doing well, or she, when she's had a really great game, and someone comes up to her and says, you were phenomenal tonight. And she's like, well, actually, I asked God to help me. God's given me every breath that I have. God's given me every skill that I have. So really, I would love for God to get the credit for me playing well in this game. That is worship. And this is, this is 10 years of youth ministry coming out of me right now. But I'll tell you what, I have seen basketball, volleyball, any kind of uh, high school athlete really, really worship God and do some amazing things for God getting glory when this has happened. This is, these are true stories. These have happened to several students where they've lost starting positions their senior year of their sport that they were extremely good at because they said, I refuse to make my basketball team or my volleyball team more important than my church team. My church team is my team first. And they have lost great sacrifice. They have lost starting positions. And their teachers and their coaches are like, what is so valuable about your faith? And they have a chance to share the value, the worthiness of God. Now, we could go on and on and on about all these different situations and how they are worship. But to sum it up, when we do actions with gratitude in our hearts towards God and a desire to see God glorified, that is how we turn every single action we have into worship. And it only happens when we're centered around the gospel and we constantly are grateful for the gospel. That's why the gospel needs to be in our minds every single day so that everything we do in response to the gospel, every action, every word, every thought can be out of gratitude so that it will be us presenting our bodies to God, holy and acceptable as worship. This is how we show God's worth. Now remember, Paul's using the word sacrifice for a reason. You are going to have to sacrifice things because God is going to ask you to do things that you don't want to do, that do not feel natural or reasonable to you. But the question has to be asked, is God worthy of your worship even when you don't feel like giving it to him? I've been thinking a lot about Adam Yoder the last week and a half. And I know we are so sad over his sudden death. I know a lot of us are mourning this this past week and a half. Uh, He was a very loved member of our church, one of our very faithful missionaries that we sent out. And the more I thought about Adam and I was getting ready for this sermon, the more I thought, what a great example of a living sacrifice presented to God. See, Adam grew up in this area. He grew up in a very nice home. He grew up in a very nice community. He had a wonderful family, great parents. 
He wanted to be a, a middle school teacher, got his teacher's degree with a 4.0 GPA. He was a smart guy, had a lot of potential. But through experiencing short-term mission trips, Adam began to notice God renewing his mind. And the Holy Spirit started speaking to him and saying, I want you to go to Ecuador as a full-time missionary. And like all of us, Adam became very nervous and recognized what God was asking him to do. In fact, he didn't even want to tell his parents about it. Remember him talking about it. He didn't want to tell his parents about it because he was so scared. Well, he just knew how hard it was going to be on them. To have a son travel across the world and, and barely see him. But he knew it was what God was calling him to do. He had two, out of school, out of college, he had two incredible job offers right here locally for him. That would pay way better than anything Ecuador could offer him as a middle school teacher. But he knew what God was asking him to do. His first months in Ecuador after he moved were a nightmare. Every part of him wanted to come back here. As he tried to adapt to a new foreign culture, foreign people, foreign language. Every part of him wanted to come back here. But he refused to. He gave in to his cravings because he knew that God was calling him to be a living sacrifice. For 10 years, for the last 10 years, Adam has been advancing the gospel in Ecuador as a missionary, has made a huge kingdom impact, and he never got off the altar, never threw in the towel and all the frustrations and gave up and just came home, just remained faithful as a living sacrifice to his final breath, which was a week and a half ago. What a great example we have right here at Fairlawn of what a living sacrifice looks like. Let's keep, let's keep going here with verse number two as Paul continues to make his appeal. He says, do not be conformed to this world. Now, do not be conformed to this world has been a huge debate among Christians for many, many, many years. Um, I mean, we can all agree that on a broad sense it means don't sin like the world sins. Like we know we're not supposed to sin. But... How far do we go in not conforming to the world? I mean, do we decide not to drive cars? Some people in our community think that's the right response. Do we decide not to uh, have cell phones? Do we, decide not to, do we decide just to make our own clothes and not wear worldly clothes? Do we not watch TV? Do we not listen to secular music? Do we say no beer and no dancing? Do we choose not to interact with anybody who is not a Christian. How far do we go to not conform to the world? What is Paul meaning here, do not conform to the ways of the world? This can become even more confusing when you recognize in the broader sense of Scripture, even in the broader sense of just Paul talking and teaching us in the New Testament, that there is another message Paul gives that on the on the surface, seems very contradictory to do not conform to the world. In uh, 1 Corinthians 9.22, he says something that seems opposite. He says, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. So here in 1 Corinthians, Paul's saying, I'm becoming everything to everybody. I'm trying my best to fit in. I'm trying my best. If, if somebody is outside the law, I'm a rebel too. I'm outside the law. If somebody is a really religious person inside the law, I'm a re really religious person inside the law. I'm doing whatever it takes to relate to as many people as possible, becoming all things to all people that by some way I might relay the gospel in a way that they understand. And then you got Paul over here saying, do not conform to the world. You feel the tension? I mean, what, what's right here? Well, they're both right. They're both a spiritual, biblical truth. 
How do we, how do we balance between the two? I felt this, this uh, tension in youth ministry. In fact, some of you guys might have even called me a hypocrite if you heard my conversations with students because one student would come to me and say, Keith, I'm really struggling with my friend group. And after hearing the situation and spending time praying with them, I said, I feel like you need to say goodbye to that friend group. They're pulling you down, man. You have to step away. Put some dividers up in those friendships. And then the very next week, another student would come to me and say, hey, Keith, I'm struggling with my friend group. And I would listen and pray with them, and I would say, man, I'm, I'm really sensing from God that you need to lean into that friend group. You need to start hanging out with them more. You need to go to that party. You need to make sure you learn those video games so you can be hanging out with them because God is calling you to share the gospel with them, and you have to speak their language and be in their world. We feel this tension also when Jesus prayed in John 17. In John 17, Jesus was praying for his disciples, and he said, I ask that you don't take them out of the world. Make them a part of the world, God. Don't take them out. They got a mission to do. Keep them from the evil one, but they got a mission to do. But then he goes on to pray, they are not of the world. They're not of it. They're not of it. They're completely different. Don't let them conform to the world. We see this with Jesus himself when he walked on earth. We see Jesus becoming human and being tempted in every way. I mean, he was labeled drunkard, glutton, a sinner because of the people he hung out with. And then you see another side of Jesus that refused to conform to the world. So much so he stuck out. Then they crucified him for it. He just did not fit in. So what do we do with this tension? What, what's the balance? What's, what's right? How do we process this? What's wise? Well, Paul gives us the key in this next line. He says, do not conform to this world, and here's the key, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What Paul means is that the only way to navigate through how to be in this world and not of this world is to have your personal mind, not your pastor's mind, not your neighbor's mind, not the person sitting next to you this morning's mind, your personal mind transformed, renewed by God. God has to renew your mind. Otherwise, you are a lost cause. And you will either, one of two things, you'll either be sucked into the ways of the world as you try to fit into the world and relate to the world as a Christian. You're going to be sucked in. And your eyes are going to be calloused and cold to the sin. And you'll become just like the world. They won't even see a difference and you'll become just like them. Or you're going to go to the other extreme without your mind being renewed. And you're going to put up rules and religion, and you're going to say, we've got to set up all these safeguards so that we don't conform to the world, and you'll end up looking so different from the world. You'll be a turnoff to everything of God as people look at you, and you will miss the mission that God is calling you on to advance the gospel. Nobody's going to want what you have to offer because it looks like chains. So Paul's saying here, the key to this is not, it's not reading more scripture. It's not hearing more teachings and sermons. It's not trying to follow more moral principles in order to not be conformed to the world. No, what Paul is saying, the only thing that will keep you from conforming to the pressures of this world is to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Changing the way that you think and process through the Holy Spirit. The rules will end up hurting you and proving to be chains. And the only way to not conform to the world is to be transformed by God. So what that means, what that means is if you want freedom in your Christian walk, the only way to obtain freedom is to allow God to renew your mind. That you're making decisions based on the way God desires for you to think and process your personal individual life, which no one else is living but you. Now, I want you to see this connection between freedom and renewal of our minds. So trek with me. It's a little difficult to understand, but I think we can do it this morning. It took me a while as I was studying to really grasp this. 
our minds are sinful, right? Nod your head if you agree with me. Our minds are sinful, right? Our natural tendencies is to do stuff that's sin. So sin has consequences. Can we agree on that? All sin has consequences, right? So if something has consequences, if we have to pay for it, is it free? No, it's not free. So therefore, sin can never lead to freedom. Because at the end, when we stand before God, if you have sin, you will have to pay for it. And it leads to death. So sin in no way can lead to freedom. So if we desire sin and do it, we have to pay for it. It's not free. But when God renews our minds and when we start to desire the right things, because remember what freedom is. What's freedom? Freedom is doing what I want to do, right? Desiring something, I want to do it, and I'm free to do it. No consequences, right? That's, that's freedom. So when we actually desire to do what is right because God has renewed our minds, we are then free to do what we desire without consequences. Again, there'll be earthly consequences. You know, the world hates us. But the, the, the end, when we stand before the judge, there are no consequences there because we did what we call righteousness. And we're free to be righteous without consequence. So righteousness will always, learn to, uh, will always lead to freedom. Okay, let me see if I can give you an example here to help unpack this. I don't like salads. I'm just, I mean, they're okay. I'll eat them. They're good for me. I eat salads. I don't like salads. When I'm at a restaurant and some waitress sets down a salad for me, I may nibble at it, but really, um, I just look at it as a promissory note that the real food is about to arrive soon. So I get excited. I get excited about that. Um, so I get excited with a salad, but not to eat it, just that the real food is about to arrive soon. Um, but because of my diet and not liking healthy foods, um, I feel chained. I feel chained up in my diet because the foods that I really desire to eat have bad side effects. You know what I'm talking about? Have bad side effects. All right? So the food that I really want to eat don't bring me freedom. And the food that I should be eating, I don't want to eat. So my diet, I'm restricted in my diet. I feel chained up in my diet. But guess what? What happens if one day I would wake up and all of a sudden, my taste buds would have been renewed, and now I find salads just as savory as Burger King. I mean, just as good as Burger King. And I would desire, my, my greatest desire for my taste buds would be to consume and eat salads. I would find freedom in my diet, because that which I great desire, I could eat as much as I wanted of. And it would be good for me. There would be no bad side effects. There would be no consequences. For that, what freedom I would experience in my taste buds. And that's exactly what it has to do with the renewal of our minds and freedom. When God renews our minds, we are free then to do exactly what we desire because God has been changing our desires and there are no consequences for doing what's right. We can go around saying, Yes, my greatest desire is to glorify God, and there's no consequence for it. Any little trial I go through, oh my goodness, it's gonna be so worth it for what God's going to do in the end. There's no consequence to making my greatest desire God being glorified. In the end, that will only be rewarded. All right, let's keep moving here. Do not be conformed to this world, by, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. If you want to know the will of God so that you can have freedom and so that God is glorified through your life, which should be our chief goal here, you must have your mind renewed. The Holy Spirit must be the one guiding you, giving you daily directions. I'll tell you why. 95% of your choices are not premeditated. 95 of the words you say, 95% of the words you say, 95% of the, your actions just come out naturally. Just whatever's inside just comes out. And so it's impossible. There's no way that you could do the will of God or even be able to discern what the will of God is if, you have not, if your mind has not been renewed. A mind that God is transforming and thinking like a, like a believer should. Because we're born with a sinful nature. We naturally want to do what's wrong. But when the Holy Spirit transforms us, our mind becomes righteous and we desire what is right. Not out of pressure, not out of fear, but we start obeying God out of our desire because we love him, and we want to see him glorified. And we're so thankful for the gospel. It's out of love and pleasure that we end up naturally doing what God wants us to do. Because we desire to see God 
glorified. I think the appropriate response to these two verses this morning would be to give everyone in this room a chance to have a conversation with God, to present themselves, their bodies, your personal body, as a living sacrifice to God. I don't want this to just be a Sunday morning where we talked about being a living sacrifice and we talked about not conforming to the world and we talked about the freedom that God has given us by renewing our minds. I want this to be a Sunday that we actually earnestly prayed for it. And again, offered our bodies. Because this is a process. This doesn't happen overnight. It's as God renews our mind, we, became to come, we began to become more aware of how to worship him with every aspect of ourselves. I especially want that prayer to be for those of you here today that Christianity feels like chains. It just feels like a bunch of rules so you don't go to hell just doesn't feel like freedom. My prayer is that as you offer your bodies to God as a living sacrifice and as he renews your mind, you will be able to understand how important and your desires will change to really truly desire that God is glorified. And then you can freely live out of those desires as God renews your mind. Uh, there's a bridge to a hymn that we sing here at church, and I think it sums up well the rightful prayer after studying these two verses. Uh, the hymn is, To God Be the Glory. Uh, the bridge was written and added on to uh, the hymn in reflecting on the life of Brian Stolzfus. Uh After his tragic death, I, I was contemplating the legacy that he left behind as one of our amazing missionaries and one who faithfully and selflessly served other people for the sake of the gospel. Uh, Brian was a, a personal, very good friend of mine. I know of many of yours, too. Um, Brian could have bragged about his great adventures. Brian could have bragged about his crazy life because there's a lot of crazy stuff he was doing for the kingdom. He did some amazing things and literally impacted thousands upon thousands of people. But... Brian made it clear that he simply wanted to be faithful to God and see God glorified. So I was, I was working on rearranging this hymn to God with the glory, writing kind of a fair long version of this hymn, when I got the call on a Monday morning that he had died, tragically in a plane crash. And I know a lot of us remember that moment well, as our hearts broke. So a couple days after the memorial service, myself and a few others gathered at church here, and uh, we wrote this bridge inspired by Brian's godly legacy of being a living sacrifice. And this is what the bridge says. It says, all I have and all I am for your glory, for your fame, let there be less of me and more of Jesus. What an appropriate prayer after studying Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're going to give you a time to, to pray that out, to spend time before God. Saying, God, all that I have, all that I am, it's for your glory. It's for your fame. Not me. In fact, I want there to be less of me. As you renew my mind, would there be less of me and more of Jesus? When people see me, they see Jesus. I want every part of me. And it's a journey, but I want every part of me to reflect you well and to be presented to you as worship to you. So go ahead and bow your heads. I'll give you a moment here. And just spend time praying to God, presenting your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. God, I know we're broken people. We're so far from this reality, but we thank you for the ways that you have been renewing our minds. We thank you for the way that you have been teaching us how to act more in a way of worship to you than our own selfish desires, God. And we just ask you to be patient with us and for your spirit to keep working with us as we strive to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to you that we would know through your guiding of your Holy Spirit, how not to be conformed to the world, but how to be transformed 
that we would know your will. And it would be our greatest desire to walk in your will so that people could experience the glory of God and people could experience the gospel and that you would be honored by us. Thank you for every person in this room. Thank you for every person on the live stream. As we lean in together to your word, help us not to be just hearers but doers. In your name we pray. Amen.